Hi, everybody. Hey, Rosemary. Hi, Rebecca. Rosemary. How are you? I'm well. How are you doing? Good. How do I make you a co-host? Uh, go into participants. Yes. And then... I'll make co-host. There yeah. you go. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody. How's it going? Good. 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 All right. I'm going to start letting the guests in maybe in like 10 minutes or so. Not quite yet. Um, so yeah, just a little, um, I guess, overview of how the night's going to go. Right now, it's about 15 minutes before the start. Um, about five minutes beforehand, we'll start to um, admit the guests. And we'll, I'll do a brief intro. And then um, we'll start with the first pitch. And after the pitches, you'll do um, a really brief uh, Q&A, maybe like three or four minutes. People will be typing um, their questions into the chat box. You guys can kind of get an idea of what they're gonna be asking. I'll pick some probably randomly. And um, yeah, try to keep your answers relatively concise. And um, make sure that throughout the um, call that you are um, paying attention, awake, <laughs> and um, yeah, not looking too relaxed. <laughs> All right, does anybody have any questions? You guys ready? Good luck, everybody. Are there going to be like judges or is it just people watching? So the audience is going to pick their favorite at the end. Oh, okay. So the audience is the judge. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good. I have a question about this. Sure. Um, so basically we're going to go in order and you're going to show the pitches and then is there questions after every pitch show yeah. or is it all at the end okay after every pitch yeah okay and then um so like for example i wouldn't have to like present anything live correct just answering the questions okay, okay. yeah and i have all your okay. pitches on my computer so i'm just going to share my screen one at a time awesome and then um, just for you, I um, I wasn't able to uh, record a Zoom call that was synchronized with my voice. So I like edited a video that like- Oh, um, I'm just together. gonna go with what I have right now. Cause I don't really have time to download anything new at this point. Uh, Cause I've got everything all queued oh. up, okay? Okay, it's, um, okay. I uploaded it last night. It's in the folder. Um, I don't okay. think you have to download it. Yeah, I can send it to you right now. Thanks, Jackie. Professor, you got mine from last night, right? I have everybody, yes. Here, I'll send it to you. I don't, all right. Um, at this point, I, it's kind of too late to do this, I think. Um, really? I worked so hard on that, like, all day yesterday. <laughs>
I like the background. Guy. Okay, I got it, Samara. I've swapped it. Okay. Oh yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yep. Um. Uh, so will everybody be joining this call? Yes. Oh. Okay. I think it's a good game. All right. I like the venture themed backgrounds. No, it's right. <laughs> I like it. All right, so we're gonna start letting people in in about three minutes, all right? And everybody, this is Rebecca, in case you haven't already met her. She um, works, she created the website. So you guys have all been in touch with her at one point or another. And she's going to be co-hosting the meeting tonight. So helping me mute people and <laughs> just help with everything. She's great. And I control the vote, so. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I have a quick question about the Q&A session. Yes. Um, is there going to be a time limit? Like, are we going to be told to stop? Or like, is someone going to tell us like, you know, that's about time for this answer. And then we probably won't. Yeah, finish. it'll be around like probably three to five minutes per pitch, I would say. Mm -hmm. And that's um, for the entire Q&A session, right? So yeah, it's going to be pretty rapid. So sure. yeah, try to keep your, oh, nice, nice, Tommy, cool. So try to keep your um, <laughs> your answers relatively concise and um, yeah. Definitely, thank you. How do we do this background thing? <laughs> you just change the logo to, uh, change the virtual background to your logo. If you have the logo downloaded on your local computer. It's in the settings of like the main Zoom screen. Yeah. Yeah, you can go to the little arrow that's next to video, pop that up, and then you can change your background. Everybody's like deep in thought. <laughs> okay, so in a second, I am going to um, mute everybody and then start letting people in, okay? Oh, nice. I'll mute myself too. Quick question, Rosemary. Do you do you want to deal with any questions that may come in through the chat, or do you want? So people as to the ask questions them? come in through the chat, I'm gonna so I'm gonna ask everybody to type their questions into the chat okay. as we go, and then I'll just like select a few, and I'll just be like, Joe Schmo. Okay. And then have Great. them ask. Okay. All right. Let's start letting people in. Hey, everybody. Hi, how are you? Welcome. Hello. Hello. Hey, John. Oh, What's right. going on, Rebecca? Not much. How about you? You get to the joy of seeing me twice in one week, though. <laughs> I do the That's why one. I signed up specifically. I get Hi, Rosemary. Hi, how are you? Good. 
fearless leader. Hey, Bill. How are you? All right. All right. All right, so we're just getting everybody in from the waiting room and we'll get started off in about five minutes. Let's see what do we got here. Um, so we're just going to mute everybody as people are entering the call um, and the pitches will be pay, uh, played from my computer once we get started up. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Just getting everybody into the Zoom call.
Hi, everybody. We're just going to wait one or two more minutes here um, as we're getting people into the Zoom call, and then we'll get started up. All right, so we're going to get started. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wesleyan University Startup Incubator Demo Day. This event is brought to you by the Patricelli Center for Social Entrepreneurship, the Muse Plus co-working initiative at the Middlesex Chamber of Commerce and Reset Social Enterprise Trust. I'm Rosemary Ostfeld, and I'm the instructor of the Startup Incubator, which is a one semester experiential learning program offered by the Patricelli Center for Social Entrepreneurship. This course allows students to explore their ideas and turn them into a reality. During this course, students have defined their core values, interviewed experts in their field, identified initial customers, explored competitors, designed a minimum viable product, and prepared the pitches you are about to watch. Students have also received mentorship from alumni, members of the community, tech stars, and SCORE. Tonight, you'll hear from nine students, each with their own business idea. Each venture has prepared a pre-recorded pitch. As the pitches are running, please type any questions you have into the chat box. I'll pick a few questions for the live Q&A, which will happen right after each pitch. We'll watch the first five pitches with Q&A, take a short break, and then watch the final four before we vote for your favorite pitch. All right, so we'll start off with the first one. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Chunyu, and I'm the founder of Green Angel, a software company that promotes efficient carbon risk management through AI-driven operation optimization. COVID-19 has completely changed my lifestyle. These days, I purchase everything online and get them delivered directly to my door. After millions of times of taking prepackaged food from Uber Eats or boxes from Amazon Locker, I began to wonder, what is the climate impact of this and how can it be tracked? Before the pandemic hit, Distribution-related emission was projected to rise by 32% in the next decade. Now, this trend is expected to accelerate tremendously. However, it only represents one link of a company's operation. For most of the businesses, more than 70% of the emission comes from operational activities. It includes extraction of raw materials, waste generated during the production, storage and distribution of products, and even the commuting and traveling of employees making these products. Traditional method of carbon accounting measures the emission after such activities happen, and it usually fails to quantify the operational emissions timely and accurately. Imagine that you are the chief environmental officer working on an annual report of the carbon emission. How do you figure out the carbon emission due to distribution of products? Well, headache time. 
because unfortunately you have to track down every piece of information by contacting individual employees or departments in charge of reimbursement. And that means lots and lots of emails and long waiting time. It also naturally introduces latency and inaccuracy as well. At Green Angel, we know that you don't have the time for this, and we think the environment calls upon us for a more urgent and more reliable solution. We improve the process by offering accurate prediction of carbon footprints. Let's delve deeper to investigate how we get the essential work done. Let's change the situation. What if back then when you planned everything, there was a magic voice telling you how to plan these operations in the most carbon efficient way and maybe even less costly as well. This is the kind of experience you will get at Green Angel. On the right side of the slide, you see a blueprint design of the Green Angel using AI algorithms to simulate and optimize distribution of operations of our client company. Computers explore what, what if scenarios and make recommendations to bring out the most effective combination of efficiency and environmental considerations. This slide is another demonstration page where you can see the status of the AI simulation of various upstream activities, such as the raw materials allocation, the end product distribution, and the employee commuting. You can click on the finished simulation to view the recommended strategy by the Green Angel software. Based on the optimized strategy, we calculate and predict the carbon emissions. The prediction then serves as a benchmark of your company's actual performance. On this main dashboard, you will be able to track and compare your performance with the theoretically optimized one. Green Angel is a platform as a service company. We provide the previously described services through subscription. It will be the key source of our revenue. So how does the market look like? Well, in the US, the government legislation for emission is getting stricter. Investors are showing interest in the carbon risks of their portfolio companies. And consumers are demanding greener products as well. As a result, the carbon management market was valued at $10.93 billion in 2019. It is also projected to grow to up to $21.7 by 2025. And we focus on small to medium enterprises in this market segment, because unlike Amazon or UPS, they are constrained in technology and finance to de develop efficient management system that could help them to plan. Therefore, they will be more likely and willing to seek support from a third party company like Green Angel for such initiatives. Locally, more and more Connecticut SMEs, such as Checkmark Lumber or Forestone, are partnering up with the environmental agencies to improve their operation sustainability. We would like to focus on them as our entry point into the market. In comparison to competitor companies, Green Angel is SME focused, which allows us to respond quickly to the unique demand based on the nature of our client. Secondly, instead of providing support to traditional method of carbon accounting, Green Angel approaches this issue from a very different angle. With the AI algorithm, we simulate and predict the emission even before they actually happen. And this hence makes us faster and more accurate than anyone else. To date, I have developed the user interface of the program and working on the development of the algorithms. I aim to complete the first version of the program in the next six months. Once the software is finished, Green Angel will offer free trials to our customers and gradually expand our user base. I plan to seek cooperation from environmental agencies to attain market share and credibility as well. I would like to work with aspiring engineers who wish to contribute to the sustainability field. We also invite SMEs that are interested in Green Angel to work with us and develop their first customized model as well. 
I'm confident that Green Angel will bring the positive changes to the current field and effectively solve all the critical pain points of carbon management. You can reach out to me for any question. With that, I thank you for your time and consideration. Great, thank you so much. Well so does anybody have any questions? Feel free to type them into the box or type your name and we can ask some questions of Chen Yu. I have one question, Rosemary. Sure. It's Frank LaMonica from SCORE. Chen Yu, um, you mentioned the SME as a target market. Have you considered the not-for-profit sector? Um, um, yeah, definitely. That's one of the considerations that we have right now. But um, at the early stage, um, where I'm just trying to develop the algorithms and everything, I still want to focus on the um, um, just the SME sector. And um, and I think there is definitely potential of venturing into the uh, nonprofit as well. But we have to look into that in the future. We have another question from Gary Feinstein. Uh, yes, I just wanted to know if there's some way that clients will be able to customize this for their specific needs at some point, because I would, I would think that different kinds of industries would have, you know, totally different, you know, ways they generate carbon. Well, definitely. Um, thank you for your question. So I, my answer to the question is yes. Um, um, definitely will we'll offer different uh, kind of customization based on the specific needs um, of the client's industry. So for example, if you have a heavier emphasis on um, distribution of the products, then we will have like more, um, we will have the algorithms which takes care of, you know, the planning of the um, uh, transportation and distribution. However, if you have a more heavier like emphasis on the manufacturing, then there will be more, uh, there will be algorithms taking care of that as well. So that's the whole point of, um, uh, responding quickly to the demand of our clients and we want to work with um, specific like different um, client companies to tailor to their specific needs. Okay, we have one more question from Jen Alexander and then we'll move on to the next pitch. Okay, so um, basically I just thought it was a really strong presentation visually. There was a moment where I found myself wondering whether I was understanding what you were saying and what the service does. And it was the moment where there was that slide that has kind of three rows and a, you know, there's one truck going to two boxes and then there's two trucks going to three boxes. And, sure. and that was the moment where I wished that you had given me just one specific example. For example, uh, here's how changing the packaging would change the impact, or here's how changing the transportation would change the impact. And so that, that was just a question of whether it would be possible to add some, a little more specific. And I also really liked um, when you mentioned Shagbark Lumber, that really helped me picture who might use the service. So that's it's sort of a question. Sure, um, thank you so much for your suggestion. And um, I would like to say that, yeah, definitely to explain a little bit more on that slide. So you can see there are three different scenarios. Um, all of them are going to be simulated by the AI algorithms. And the, the, the pictures that are there just to show that, you know, there are different ways for you to do this kind, to do the distribution. And you can choose which one to use. And um, with every one of them, we will provide, you know, what specifically you need to do and how much emission will be generated because of that. So it, this is the whole idea of, you know, we simulate all the possibilities or like most of the possibilities of doing a certain activity before you even do it. And then you choose the one that you think um, will balance your, you know, the, the cost and, and also your environmental considerations. And then once you choose that um, solution, we will already know what kind of emission you will be generating because of that. And that's, that's the whole point of, you know, knowing it before it, ac it actually happens. So I hope that makes it a bit like clearer on what, I'm trying to convey with that slide. Yeah, it's helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank okay, now we're going to move on to um, the next presentation. I'm just making sure we're doing roughly 10 minutes per presentation and questions. So I'm going to share my screen for the next one.
Hi, I'm Paris, a Wesleyan junior and creator of Nebula Chess, a kid subscription box game that focuses on creating fun adventures for children while allowing them to develop their critical thinking and decision-making skills. The kids subscription box market faces three problems. The first problem is that as children develop month to month, they pick up new interests and parents often have to jump from one subscription box to the next. The second problem is keeping children entertained, especially for working parents or children who are out of school. This ties hand in hand the third problem of finding alternative sources of entertainment that help children get off their computers, TVs, and phones, in which they can spend a total of five to seven hours on a day. Our solution is a mix of choose your own adventure slash escape room game that exposes children to different career paths. The basic structure of the game and characters would stay the same, but for each box, the child's special power would change, would reflect a new role model, like a marine biologist, an animator, an astronaut, or an engineer. The physical box will include four items, including a booklet that guides the children through the adventure, a digital app for answers, a fashion item or toy that gives the children their special powers, and physical rewards, including popsicle recipes and a rainbow dragon pin. Depending on their decision earlier in the game to fight trap or negotiate with the evil sorcerer, they will also earn one of the following badges below, and this gives the players an incentive to replay the game and earn all the badges. The customer market would be children ages six to eight that enjoy fantasy and have younger siblings. This would allow the service to go from one child in the family to the next. The subscription market is worth $7 billion with 100% industry growth year over year. And in this market, the children's section is still developing. We would focus on online shoppers as 54% of online shoppers already have a subscription service and the average customer is subscribed to two boxes. This means that you don't have to compete with boxes in different categories, but rather just children's subscription boxes. While there are competitors in this space, none of them have the same focus as us. Boxes on the top, like Green Kid Crafts, Little Passports, or Kidster, are all project-based activities and focused around their themes. Meanwhile, boxes that are focused on immersing a player in a game, like Escape the Crate or Conundrum, are designed to be played by parents, not kids. The only box that resembles our goal is Superpower Academy, which has a story-based STEM learning activities. Our boxes will fill a niche for puzzle-like games designed for children that aren't focused around educational activities, but rather incorporate critical thinking and emotional skills in a gamified way. To test out the idea, I interviewed eight experts and four potential customers. From the interview with experts, I learned to narrow the children's age group, age group we were targeting, and to integrate gamification into an overarching goal, and to understand how, what, and why kids engage in certain experiences. For the potential customers, I interviewed two teachers and two parents. Both teachers mentioned that social slash emotional skills aren't taught enough in classroom, classrooms, and one of the parents also mentioned a willingness to pay for a box that requires critical thinking in a fun way. The business model for this product would be a bi-monthly box with the sample cost for our boxes being around 13 to $15, including the cost of game items, custom packaging, a flat shipping fee cover, and digital costs like website hosting. Our subscription box would be sold for $26.99 on CreateJoy, a subscription box marketplace, and then can move on to its own Shopify website. Our two main focuses when creating the boxes would be sustainability and game design. In our sustainability, we would focus on having recycled packaging and sourcing from recycled manufacturing. For, for game design, we would focus on partnering with local artists for our visual design and then partnering with local teachers to understand what educational theories we should use for each game option.
grave obstacle. Our timeline would be to micro launch in February, testing the game with 10 pair partner families from Middletown. Through this, we'd be able to get data on what we need to improve upon. Then we'd work on finalizing the game kit, identifying sustainable manufacturing partners, and finding a local artist to elevate the game design. Finally, we'd launch a crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter, which has a very strong game community, and update our Shopify website. We want to create the most exciting, engaging subs subscription box game for kids. So if you know anyone with ch children ages six to eight, please reach out or anyone who can help with game manufacturing would be amazing. And thank you so much for listening and everyone who's helped me in this journey folks so far. You can find us at our Instagram or on our website. And you can also find my contact information below to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Paris. Does anybody have any questions? Dan Bloom. Oh, I guess I'm, I guess I'm talking here, huh? Yes. Um, cool. <laughs> uh, well, I, I love this idea. Uh, I think it's really fun. And, and uh, with someone with three nephews, I, I feel like there's, and, and, and a friend of mine who opened one of the one of the more successful what are they called the escape rooms in Rhode Island yeah. um, definitely feel like the bringing that into the home and making it an activity for kids is a really great idea so so kudos uh, on, on on kind of seeing that in that vision I think it's it's great um, but I, I'm interested in, in your in your thought process around crowdfunding because um, you know as someone who started a tech company we had you know we had to build the product before we could get paid when you have a physical, when you have something like this, you could, you know, basically charge, you could have people pay for the product in advance and use that to get the first run, like in a small batch, um, and then use that to, to get going. So I'm curious what you think is the reason, like, like why, why did you come to the conclusion that crowdfunding is the way to go as the, for, for, for this yeah. venture? Um, so I came sort of to that as like an avenue of one, a way to like, sort of find customers that are already like in tune with like a gaming community and have that like knowledge and expertise so like sort of get like their opinions on the game through that through the crowdfunding way but also as like just like a way to like sort of like build um momentum around like a launch um so it's like a good way to like be able to raise the funds to sort of manufacture like a game that has a lot of pieces and a lot of pieces that might be hard to produce um, cheaply otherwise if it's not sold in a large batch. So having that would help. So thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take one more question. So we'll do two questions per pitch. Um, the next one was from Bill Ward. Go ahead. Oh, I see it. Um, so the attractiveness of the kit subscription model is for me at least independent of COVID. Um, just cause like with me and my friends, it sort of started out as an idea like that where I was like, if I was a kid, this wouldn't really like seem fun to me when I was playing one of the um, escape the crate boxes. So I just sort of went down that and discovered there wasn't really any like viable solutions for that. So it is independent of COVID. And I think it could like be a sustainable option in an alternative to a physical escape room or puzzle activity. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Paris. All right. So um, if I don't get to your question, we're going to save the chat and then the students will have those questions um, later. All right, so next up is Austere Rescue. Good evening, I'm Taylor Chosas, founder of Austere Rescue. I've been working in rescue my entire life, and that's because I, I really truly feel that there's nothing greater than being able to bring somebody home when they're having the worst day of their life. 
Alistair Rescue is actually going to take that one step further to prevent that person, that team, from ever needing to be rescued in the first place. And we're going to do that through training, customized kit building, and direct paramedic support. The goal of Austere Rescue is to take care of your team so that way they can focus on the mission. Now, in order to tell you a little bit more or for you to understand where Austere Rescue comes from, I need to talk a little bit about my background. I spent eight years working as a pararescuman in the Air Force, which provides rescue to air crews that are flying missions in combat environments. I worked as a guest instructor at the International Special Training Center, combat medic course. I worked in Papua New Guinea, supporting oil and gas discovery projects in a remote environment. And then recently I also worked for NASA and SpaceX, planning the rescue operations for if their capsule comes back off of the intended target. The first of which SpaceX just launched on last month, which is pretty cool. So what all these have in common is if it's a, a pilot going out to fly a mission, um, a scientist going out to work in some of these remote environments, or an astronaut going to work on the International Space Station, they need to focus on their mission. So this safety net that's provided is to ensure that they can perform at their peak, which is extremely important when you're working on something this dangerous. So during my time working in remote rescue, I've seen a couple of issues arise that caused the entire project to grind to a halt. And this can sometimes be the skill of the rescue team itself. Maybe they're great medics, but they just don't have the training to work in a remote jungle or the physical endurance to survive in that kind of a climate. The other part is the team itself, whether they don't have the proper training for that environment because they didn't have access to it, or it just wasn't provided at a level that was needed to be successful in that environment. And the last thing that I really want to focus on with Austere Rescue is making sure that we have a positive community and environmental impact into every place that we go. And it's not just focused on monetary income. We're going to achieve this by hiring within the experienced special operations community. These medics are all pre-vetted. They've been trained by the government, millions of dollars invested into them. And they have the physical ability to survive in a lot of really remote environments while still having the medical skill set necessary to provide the complete care. Now this benefits is twofold. We're gonna have medics that can handle any situation, but we're also going to have a team that can provide training above and beyond what the client requires. The second thing we're gonna do is provide this training through an online option. This will make it more accessible and affordable. And the last thing we're gonna do is work within the communities we impact. So for example, on the left there's Charlie Willie, who is one of 20 team members, all volunteer, that we trained in Papua New Guinea. And one of the skills that he learned was improvised first aid. Back in his village, they don't have a hospital, they don't have medical support. So people actually came to him when there were injuries and he was able to take care of them. And that's a small benefit we could provide to the community that we're working within. And it was no cost to the client, no extra time besides our own. The business model of Austere Rescue will be to start with online basic 101 courses. This is gonna punch blow our weight class a little bit, but it's gonna facilitate the conversation with the client to really get feedback on what kinds of technical and customized training they would like to see. Once we move into that sector, continue that relationship, build that trust for quality and technical experience to move into that direct paramedic support role. This will be the complete contracted coverage. Now, through our market research, we found Vider and Armai, which are two medical staffing companies, were two of the fastest growing companies multiple years in a row against larger competition. They were able to accomplish this by stepping in with a higher quality 
They had extreme vetting processes for everybody that they hired in the beginning. They were a little bit more expensive, but their quality spoke for itself because you don't buy the budget parachute when you go skydiving. You don't put your life into a cheaper alternative. Now, COVID-19 has led to a scale back in a lot of these projects around the world where this kind of remote medical staffing and remote medical training is needed. So what that means is once the country starts opening up again and these kinds of jobs start happening again, these contracts, there will be a need. There'll be room for a new player to step in and start bidding on some of these. Now, 67 million was awarded to Armai in 2016. That does not include the private sector. So it's extremely lucrative to work on these types of contracts. So the progress I've made so far is throughout this course, I've interviewed people that started companies like the one I'm trying to, and I found the outline for how to be successful launching an idea like this. And one of the ways to do that is by starting with this 101 training course. Now, I've already started to organize the team, which I'm going to use to facilitate this course within the unit I still work in as reserve paraestimate. And we've started to design the base services we're going to provide after we start the training and these conversations about contracts move forward. The timeline moving forward in winter 2020, we're going to build and launch the 101 travel training video beta. Then, based on feedback, we're going to move into the more specific training courses. And all of that will build the foundation to provide direct paramedic support and the full contracted coverage. Now, while we have vast experience in the technical rescue side of things, I am looking for mentorship on the business side, as well as someone with experience in government contracts. Also, we're going to need someone that has experience in web development to facilitate the one-on-one -on -one training courses and the more technical training courses as we move forward. Eventually, I will also need a med director to help write the protocols and provide oversight when we move into total contract to coverage. Now, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, or you'd just like to connect, please don't hesitate to reach out. My information is on the screen. I wanted to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Just you being here is a huge support for Wesleyan entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Questions for Taylor. Rosemary, I have one um, comment to offer to sure. Taylor. Taylor, the, um, you, you may already be aware of this, but the, uh, the SBA website, the Small Business Administration, of which SCORE is a, is a partner with, um, has a lot of information about government contracts and um, the SBA liaison with our Southeastern Connecticut chapter of SCORE out of Hartford. Um, her other job is actually in uh, government contracting for uh, promoting government contracts for, uh, for the small business community. So happy to, uh, to, to uh, link you up with her. Yeah, that'd be great, thank you. Gary Duncan, thanks you for your service. And Matt Sorkin has a question. Yeah, Taylor, uh, great job. I had a question around the uh, training aspect online and you definitely know more than me. I don't, I don't really know, so I'm just guessing. But I'm curious, how does the online experience translate to what they're doing in person? And will there have to be any like additional training in person? Because I, I just imagine um, it's something you have to experience in real life. So I'm curious how you thought about that. Absolutely. I think it's one of those things. Um, I've been to so many courses where, yeah, the hands-on is, is a very important aspect of that. I think it's going to have to be dependent on the client. What we're trying to do in the initial stages is the online training course is, like I said, the 101 kind of a thing. It's for maybe a student going out to a remote location, and we're going to bring in stories and experiences and say, Here's what you need to know for the basics so that you can get home safely. Um, moving into more technical stuff, there is going to have to be some hands-on. That's kind of unavoidable, but I think by keeping it online at first and keeping it simple, it's going to extend our runway and make this 
um, the network grow, which is the initial uh, most important part. Thank you. Great questions. Um, I'll move on to the next pitch, but there are a few more questions in the chat and Taylor, yeah, just take a peek at those later. All right. Hi, welcome. My name is Nelida Samada. I'm a Questbridge scholar at Wesley and I'm creator of this small business. <sighs> Aloha everyone, and welcome to Hearth Creative Co, where heart and earth harmonize. At Hearth Creative Co, I create ethical, natural jewelry that is intentionally crafted to harmonize the wearer with their heart and the earth. What do I mean by this? Let's start by looking at the problem. Unethical mining companies have left vast holes in not just the earth, but the surrounding local communities alike. Precious metals are limited resources. After a mine has been depleted, it is extremely difficult to properly restore mine. Mass jewelry and the damage done to the land by mining companies are direct links. The Wijaritari know and are trying to let us know that the destruction of this territory threatens the balance of life in this planet. This quote is from a review on a documentary I watched a few months ago, which motivated me to take the necessary steps to craft my own jewelry business as ethical and sustainable as possible. The Wicaritari, also known as the Huichol, are an indigenous tribe from my hometown in Mexico that has been impacted by industrial mining companies. For this reason, at Hearth Creative Co., it is my mission to provide you with a product that is finely crafted and is rooted in heart aligned practices for the earth and its people. By wearing Hearth Creative Co's Heart Home Earth collections, clients have the opportunity to engage with custom fine jewelry in an ethical and sustainable way. At this moment, Hearth Creative Co is using recycled metals and resourcing items from ethical providers for gems and stones. Additionally, I find shells and sea glass and other little washed up things at my local beach in Maui, Hawaii. With these materials, I make an assortment of items such as rings, bracelets, earrings, and the most common purchase, necklace pendants. Here you can see examples of previous jewelry pieces created in 2019. These are some of my favorites. Due to the rise in online availability through social media, the jewelry industry has grown tremendously on the left is my Etsy shop, and to the right is my Instagram page, another resource for potential customers. Over the last year, I have seen more creators like myself pop up online. By looking at other jewelry companies and creators, I have discovered that despite the love for crystals and precious materials, ethical and sustainable practices seem to be commonly overlooked. From the beginning, my small business has held sustainable and ethical values as top priority. For this reason, I ship every item with 100% recycled and recyclable materials. Every stone is handpicked from ethical providers and all carbon emissions from shipping are completely off put. I do this because I know that in order to be aligned with our hearts as living beings, we must first be in tune and in balance with the rhythms of the earth. We are not separate from the earth. We must treat her with respect and honor the home that Mother Earth brings us. A major part of why Hearth Creative Co. is appealing to customers is because of a unique jewelry experience I provide. I create intuitive custom pendants that are specifically tailored to my client's needs. When I have a client interested in this service, I will ask them some questions about themselves and conduct an intuitive energy reading. This allows me to choose a stone or a crystal that is right for them. I then set my intention for well-being, happiness, joy, love, or whatever other positive intention is necessary. My goal is to inspire well-being through every item sold. 
Instagram was the womb of Hearth Creative Co. And I say this because people on Instagram started reaching out to me after I posted a necklace I made for my brother. To this day, Instagram continues to be the main source of traffic for Hearth Creative Co. Now, Hearth Creative Co. is expanding. Having a professional website will allow me to engage with my community in a way that increases the potential for community fundraising efforts, campaigns, and various other partnerships I hope to launch within the next few years. Moving forward, I would love to see Hearth Creative Co. reaching the hearts of more individuals through a developed e-commerce marketing strategy. By 2021, I hope to be vending at local farmers markets as well as local shops in Maui. Eventually, I would love to see a team from Hearth Creative Co. go into areas where mining companies have negatively impacted earth to start community gardens and soil restoration projects. This is a big project that would take a group of committed individuals as well as funding. And so my ask for you today is to share Hearth Creative Co. with your friends and family. Please, 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 please. By doing so, you can help bring awareness to the importance of sustainable practices in the jewelry industry. Plus, you may end up finding a lifelong crystal companion to adorn your body with. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you on the website. The shop is now officially live. Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you, Samara. All right, do we have some questions for Samara? Take two questions. Michaela. Thank you, Rosemary. Beautiful pitch, Samara. Thank you for that. I'm wondering that if, um, given how much care and time goes into each piece of jewelry you create, how do you envision your business becoming scalable? How do you imagine growing uh, the quantity of items you sell and bringing people onto the team, et cetera? Um, Samara, we can't hear you. Can, oh, let's see, let me end. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hello. Thank you, Michaela, for your question. Um, so as of right now, I hand create everything, but I can foresee myself learning how to um, do other techniques instead of wire wrapping. I have uh, reached out to a teacher on the island who is a silversmith, and I hope to be learning how to cast stones soon, which would um, expedite the process of creating um, a necklace or a ring or jewelry, or I mean earrings. So that's one way that I can see myself doing that. And then once I like have designs that I create, I can have other people who know how to do silver work, silver smithing, um, I can have them put together the little pieces and because there's so many little pieces that need to go together. So that, that's one way that I can see. Thank you, Michaela. Does anyone have another question for Samara? All right, we'll move on to the next pitch. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Thanks, Samara. Um, so Daniel is in a different time zone. So this is his pre-recorded pitch, but he won't be available to do the Q&A. So please um, leave some questions in the chat for his pitch. Hello, my name is Daniel Braganza, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dosh Payments. Dosh Payments is a P2P mobile app. Our motto is payments made easy. What is the problem? Fintech is growing exponentially worldwide and the Middle East and India lag behind. The Middle East and India, unfortunately, are very cash dependent. I grew up in the Middle East and I'm originally from India. And my goal is that my startup will help introduce Fintech across the region. What does DOSH do? 
Nosh Payments is a peer-to-peer -peer mobile application with a distinct social media twist. We offer individual and group payments. Here's a user feature list. You can link your debit and credit cards on this app. You can sync it with Instagram, Facebook, or your phone number. You can request payments, track your payments, emojis. We have our own social currency. You can comment on your friend's posts. There's certain passwords and authorizations depending on the country. And we offer individual and group payments. Here's our revenue model. A bulk of our revenue will come from a 3% processing fee per transaction. Another is through instant transfers, either debit or credit card, and advertisement fees. Here's a list of competitor matrices. We have in India Paytm, Mobi, PhonePay, GoDutch, and PamPay. UPI is Unified Payment Interface, is unique in India. It allows seamless transactions in a matter of seconds. All five startups offer that. When it comes to group pay, only GoDutch is the only company that offers that. When it comes to user bases, Paytm, Mobi, and PhonePay are very developed, so they have uh, millions of users. GoDutch and PhonePay are startups. When it comes to business-to-person uh, payment transactions, Paytm, Mobi, and PhonePay offer that. GoDutch and PhonePay do not. Person to person, all five uh, are branched in that category. I would consider GoDutch and FamPay more of my competitors just because Paytm, Mobi, and PhoneFee are actually expanding and moving on to e commerce. The market size. So the global fintech market size is currently at 300 billion, but it's projected to grow at 460 by 2025. The Middle Eastern and North African fintech market is expected to reach 2.5 billion by 2022. And a KPMG report estimated that in India, it was around 8 billion in 2016 and was expected to grow by 2020 by 1.7%. Here's the latest mock-up we have of <coughs> NOSH payments. On the left-hand side, you can see the three different uh, features. Uh, individual payments where you can message your friends and send emojis and then the last two are group pay and that's where you can make certain groups with different people and split your payments within that group. On the far right is the most recent mock-up we have of the app so far. We've decided on black and white uh, just because it's unique and fintech is normally associated with blue and green. Here's the strategy and timeline. I created Dosh Payments on Jan 5th. On February 19th, I recruited two additional co-founders uh, with engineering backgrounds in India. On July 27th, uh, the initial mock-ups were complete. On August 22nd, we applied for digital licenses in India. It's very uh, costly and timely, and it takes around four months to get approved. On November 2nd, we went with a beta test with around 2,000 2, students across India. And, and in December 21st, we're expected to launch in India. So the ask. The ask what I'm, I'm looking for mentorship. I'm looking for anyone who has guidance in FinTech and can assist me in the initial stages of launch. And as I prepare for an investment round later on, but my first objective is user base and to grow that in the coming months. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Great. Right now it's 6.51. Um, we're going to take a quick five minute break and come back to watch the final four pitches.
All right, everybody, welcome back. We're going to get started with the second half. And we will start with Tommy and Squad Up. Um, here, let's mute. Hello, Collision Pitch Event attendees. My name is Tommy Alpert. I'm a senior at Wesleyan majoring in computer science and psychology. My venture is Squad Up, the mobile app for connecting people who play pickup sports. Everyone, we have a problem. Meet Steve. Steve is an avid tennis player who loves to play in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, Steve finds it difficult to organize games with people in his community. He is new to the area and hasn't made many friends, so he, he doesn't know where people usually play. He shows up to the court every morning looking for a game. Steve is disappointed when he shows up at the wrong time of the day or the wrong court and no one is there. Needless to say, Steve is pretty upset. That's when Steve finds Squad Up, the group chat platform for pickup sports. With Squad Up, any game can be created in a few taps. All you have to do is choose the sport, set a time and description, and select the location for your game. From here, the game will be visible to anyone, any pickup athlete in the area. A user can see the game time and description and even get directions to the event. Squad Up also comes with a chat that lets you easily communicate with your pickup squad. Making a group chat is easy and accessible. You can send messages and schedule games. Public chat rooms also allow people interested in a particular sport to anyone using the app. User profiles can be customized to display skill level and set the availability of a player. QR codes are useful for the quick adding of context after a pickup game. Getting in a group chat with your squad can be done easily and uniquely with this feature. In the future, Squad Up will support some other helpful features. One of these is QR codes for group chats. The customized codes will allow pickup squads to easily add new members after playing with them. There will also be a landing page for clubs and organizations in the area. People can find a club that suits their schedule while clubs can post their events on the interactive map to find new members. Steve found tennis partners and connections all while playing the pickup sports he loves. Steve found his squad just like other users on our platform. He can now send updates to them quickly, schedule games, and find new friends. The market for pickup sports is wide open. Team Snap, which is another app for sports club organization that allows sports teams with to, that help sports teams with registration, rostering, and scheduling, has 23 million users and 19,000 teams. This demonstrates that pickup groups have a need for simpler communication that solves common pain points. Play Your Court, which is an amazing website for connecting tennis players all over the country, has over 100,000 websites visits monthly. A simple search on Facebook for pickup soccer in New York City shows over 36,000 members in total. The potential for Squad Up is limitless, so it's important to correctly address the problems pickup athletes face. We sent out a survey that was completed by over 50, 50 athletes who are part of pickup sports groups in Connecticut. We found that the two most common ways pickup group leaders reach out to their members were through individually texting people and group chats and word of mouth communication. 
Additionally, over 70% of participants play pickup games regularly with more than five people. And group leaders had a lot of different pain points when organizing games for their members. The most common were getting enough people to commit and follow through, agreeing on a time and place that works for everyone, and concerns with COVID-19. Organization in pickup sports needs to be improved in a way that allows groups to communicate quickly and coordinate better. Additionally, with COVID, people want less anonymity with who they play. Squad Up solves both of these problems for pickup sports. Squad Up has a few alternatives to the solutions we provide. One category is pickup sports apps, which usually have a map for finding games, but don't have a built-in and accessible group chat feature. On top of this, most of these apps are specific to one sport, while Squad Up supports multiple different sports. Team and league apps solve many of the pain points of organization, but sometimes don't have the ability to find new events and games in the area. While these apps are not set up for pickup sports, Squad Up allows for the quick creation of group chats, which is perfect for the pickup sports environment. The last competitor would be options like Facebook groups and word of mouth communication. Facebook groups are good for finding events in the area and communicating with people in your group, but Squad Up provides real time game search and is more per personalized to sports. Word of mouth is usually how pickup sports routines are built, but if an athlete is new to an area, he might not have the connections to know about the games. Squad Up is built to accommodate these new people. Squad Up operates with a freemium model for monetization. The free plan is for individual athletes and small groups. This plan supports finding pickup sports games in your area. With the free plan, you can join as many squads as you desire. The premium plan is for group leaders of large pickup squads. They will be able to have seamless communication with their squad, find new members, and make organization easy as a few taps. The premium plan will cost $12.99 per month, which is a little below the price of team organization services like Team Snap and Open Sports. Also, only the group leader has to pay the premium, so others in the pickup squad can help contribute. The timeline for Squad Up is up in the air due to COVID. This app has the best chance of succeeding when athletes are comfortable meeting new teammates, which is, is a significant challenge right now. A rough timeline for us is to develop and test a fully functional app with core features in two months. Then in six months, our goal is to have a full release of the product and create some partnerships with sports clubs in the community. These clubs will advertise our products and create a solid user base while we provide value to them by finding new members. Finally, in a year, Squad Up will continue to improve its technology based on customer feedback and also organize free to play sports events with the users on the app to drive growth and engagement. I'm going to be developing the iOS app over the winter break, so we are always looking for someone to help on the Android side of software development. Additionally, we're looking for designers to help with logos and branding. Also, follow our journey and stay up to date with us by signing up for our MailChimp at yoursquadup.com and follow us on Instagram at your underscore squad underscore up. Thank you all so much for listening. And I hope next time you want to find a pickup game, you will look no further than Squad Up. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Great. Does anybody have some questions for Tommy? Oh, um, ooh, quite a few here. Um, Matt Sorkin. Oops. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Uh, yeah, first off, great presentation. I feel like this is an app that I definitely wanted to have when I was right out of college just to meet new people and, and play sports. My, my question is, I, I know one of the benefits of playing on like an organized... Oops. Um, I know one of the benefits of playing on an organized intramural team is they work with the local governments to like reserve courts and, and fields like that and stuff like that. 
I'm curious, have you, like, what's the process of being able to reserve fields through the app? And have you thought about connecting with any of the local governments? Um, yeah, so thank you for your question, first off. And um, yeah, so I really want to start this business in New York City, which is where I'm from. And uh, I have a few connections to the parks department there. So in terms of like permits, I'm looking to work with them. Um, yeah, does that does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool, cool. Thank you. We have another question from Jen Alexander. Yeah, yeah, it, it's along similar lines, but basically I'm wondering, um, have you thought about who are the natural constituencies other than people themselves that might want to play? Who are the other people that, or the other groups that might want to see this happen? Um, certainly town rec departments, maybe sports shops, coffee shops that would want to see activity in a certain place, maybe like anybody who's involved in like building up the quality of life in a place. But I just wondered if you've if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, so I think that's a really important part of my business because I'm definitely focused more on, you know, group activity and sports and solving uh, groups issues with organizing pickup sports. And so a lot of, I was thinking of um, working with, you know, um, works, work uh, companies also sometimes have, pick, of, have sports leagues that they organize. So, uh, and that's like, a little guaranteed profit because there's already money involved with that. Um, so working with them. And also I know a lot of um, small sports stores in my neighborhood that I think could benefit from uh, me advertising my products on the app, as well as I could benefit from them for uh, them putting on some of the customers to my service. Great, thank you. You have a few more questions in the chat, Tommy, that you can check out later. And our next cool. pitch is from Akansha. Hi, my name is Akansha Singh and I'm the founder of Outspoken. Outspoken is an English language educational program designed for the 21st century learner, aimed at empowering and giving a voice to young minds eager to contribute to the millennial workspace. I have always considered myself extremely lucky to have been brought up in a family surrounded by progressive minds, because having lived in India and South Africa, I saw the wide prevalence of orthodox mentality and differential treatment, especially when it comes to girls' education. During my 13 years in India prior to high school, I spent my time volunteering at tribal villages, public schools, and rural areas. Through these experiences, I learned a lot about my country's issues and how they all pointed towards the lack of education. Upon graduating high school from South Africa in 2017, I felt an intense urge to delve deeper into these explorations. And hence, I decided to take a gap year and join the World Bank funded socioeconomic initiative called the Jaspani Project. As a student at Wesleyan, I completed a research project for Oxford University, which allowed me to revisit my past experiences with a system mapping lens and understand the factors that hold the status quo tightly in place and prevent the existing solutions from succeeding. It allowed me to identify a few glaring gaps in the system that stirred and challenged me intellectually and made me passionate about lending my hand and filling the gap. One of the biggest revelations we stumbled upon was that many highly accomplished learners who were experts in their field of study felt very hesitant and unconfident to get out there and join the company of their dreams or pursue their personal goals. And upon conducting further research, we realized that a huge reason for it was the discomfort with the English language. To put more of a numeric value to it, around 44.9% of people in India have Googled how to speak English. In a population of 1.4 billion, that amounts to around 628 million people. Coupled with extensive research and my personal experience at grassroots level, the inherent flaws resonating across the country's language classes could be broken down into the following areas. One, an atomistic curriculum and incorrect methodology. The conservative approach of chalkboard methodology suffocates the learner into parroting a language, which could never flow without interaction. The norm is teaching through technical grammar and language, which kills the conversational correctness from developing. Secondly, most language trainers or educators themselves have incorrect grammar and enunciation. 
This passes over a chain of faulty learning practices. And thirdly, the language taught is textbook based and not applicable to real life scenarios. Moving to the particular state I have identified to start my program, Jharkhand, there's an acute problem in finding a quality program and app teacher to execute it. This is largely due to the poor literacy rate and non-exposure to the latest teaching paradigms. Outspoken is an interactive program encompassing an online and an in-classroom mode. Personalized for the 21st century learner, we have developed a very scientific eccentric program that appeals to students' needs from themes and topics that interest them to blended and flipped learning. We have drawn in the latest teaching paradigms. Our ideology is to grow our students' voice, confidence, general knowledge, and awareness and compassion so that they are brimming with confidence and ready to take on the millennial world. At Outspoken, we believe that learning is doing, and hence we have built our lessons with a core focus on real world applicability and action. The program encompasses topics of student interest, ranging, ranging from comics to social issues, music to social media. There are games and icebreakers along with exciting culminating events, motivating them to experience practical and holistic learning with the latest teaching hacks. We have integrated our curriculum into board games, readers, interactive online videos, and other teaching aids to facilitate this experience. We are incorporating the one-for-one -one business model. It can be referred to as a social entrepreneurship business model. It's a hybrid solution, a combination of both profit and nonprofit services. This model in particular resounds with my vision of one child lighting a candle for another. How does it work? When a child subscribes to a program, a certain portion of the fees would be used to fund a child with the same program in a disadvantaged rural area. We have already selected a model school in Jharkhand where we would like to offer these needy students the free program and later perhaps we could connect the provider learner and the beneficiary learner through some collaboration. We also believe that this project could serve as a role model for many other disadvantaged sectors of society across the world. We are already seeing traction from country, countries like Brazil, South Africa and Ghana. There are several huge franchisees like Pratham, Hello English, as well as small institutions. The largest successful ones have spread their branches and reached a huge target market. However, through student reviews, research and stakeholder feedback, we have recognized that a major setback in most of these initiatives is that their programs are based on textbook knowledge and technicalities of the language. So more so with the grammatical aspects of the language. Outspoken fixes that gap by promoting real world language application through active conversation, role playing and experiential learning. It is estimated that the online edtech reskilling sector in India will reach 124 billion by 2024. Also, it is expected around 2 billion people worldwide would learn English over the next decade. Our program appeals to any learner keen on bridging that skill gap that we explained in the problem landscape. Our starting point is the state of Jharkhand in India. Since through my research project, I established a strong foundation of stakeholders and customer base in that region. Currently, we are around 75% complete with our in-classroom curriculum. This incorporates lesson plans, teacher training manuals, readers, board games, worksheets, and videos. At the moment, our team is working on converting these in-classroom materials to an online platform. I'd like to end off by firstly thanking everyone for tuning in. And um, I've also provided my contact details and would most definitely appreciate and love any input or feedback that you might have for me. So please feel free to contact me. Great. Um, so Akansha is currently in a different time zone, so she can't join us for the um, in-person Q&A. But if you have any questions for Akansha, please um, type them into the chat and we'll be sure to pass those on to her. Our next pitch is from Vin with Newark Water Association. Good evening. My name is Vin Henrich, and I'm a sophomore here at Wesleyan, as well as a member of the football team. I'm the founder of Newark Water Association, a 501c3 nonprofit where we are saving lives one water bottle at a time. I thought of the idea for Newark Water Association in December of 2019 while taking a winter acting course at Rutgers Newark. 
A few of my classmates were discussing the lead water crisis. They were telling me how horrible the situation is, that they cannot safely drink, cook, shower, or brush their teeth with the water in their homes. They said that their families try to purchase water cases to at least safely drink, but a lot of the time they can't afford it. I immediately said to myself, this is not right. How can people be denied the basic human right to clean water? Now, you may wonder why I care so much about this. And the truth of the matter is that I lived in Newark for a few years in my early childhood. I drank this water. My family drank this water. Now living in West Orange, New Jersey, I can't take a sip of clean water knowing that there are 300,000 people who live five miles away from me that don't have access to it. When I asked what the government was doing about it, they told me that they just started replacing the 18,000 lead service lines, which is amazing for the future. But currently, there is no way for the people to get access to clean water. You see, the government had water bottle distributions for the first month of the crisis, but then they decided that water filters would be better. They distributed 39,000 water filters, only to find out a few months later that majority of these filters were not working because the concentration of lead was way too high for a filter to remove. Now, they only provide two cases of water to pregnant women and mothers with children six years or younger every two weeks. That averages out to 3.4 standard 16.9 ounce water bottles a day for each family to drink, cook, bathe, and keep quality hygiene. Zero bottles to children between seven and 17 years old and zero bottles for anybody else. In August of 2020, we launched our bottled water projects. And over the past four months, my team and I have raised $20,000. I negotiated a very fair price of $3,000 per 20 pallets with Costco. 20 pallets comes out to 960 cases, which is also equivalent to 38,400 bottles of water. On top of that, we have operational costs between $250 and $1,000 a month. In August, we launched our first event where we donated 38,400 bottles of water to Newark's powerhouse, Brick City Lions football organization. I decided to do our first event for the Brick City Lions because my little brother, Luke, played for one of the teams of the organization. Luke would tell me all the time how they never had any water at practice. It got so bad to the point where coaches would make a few kids responsible on the team each day for the water or else they couldn't practice. The kids were bringing pots and pans filled with the lead contaminated water just so they could play. When I told the coach that we were doing this donation, he sounded like he had tears over the phone. He said that this water would last them the entire season. We had a direct impact on 250 children and their families, and we were featured in the Star Ledger and NJ.com. Our second donation was our daycare and church event. I picked out 25 different daycares across Newark and gave them each a thousand bottles of water. Then the remaining 13,400 bottles were split between four Newark churches. I partnered with Seton Hall Prep, my old high school where they had seniors allowed to complete their senior service hours, volunteering with my organization. We had a direct impact on 2,000 children and their families. And News 12 New Jersey even did a story on us. Our Essex County Food and Water Drive will be occurring this month, where we will be surpassing 115,000 bottles of water since we started. I partnered with the Essex County Executive Joe DiVincenzo to make this event possible. And it will be our first event open to the general public of Newark. Lastly, as of now, our fourth event is scheduled to occur in January, where we will be having a police outreach donation. I partnered with Essex County Chief, Chief Spango, who is also a Seton Hall Prep alum for this event. We will be surpassing 150,000 bottles of water since the start of this journey. We have seen great success, but as I mentioned before, we've only been operating for four months. This is just the beginning. 
In the summer of 2020, we launched our bottled water projects. In the spring of 2021, we plan to launch our water filter wellness projects, where we will donate reverse osmosis, faucet top, and shower top water filters to homes and businesses that need it the most. Also in the spring of 2021, I plan on establishing another branch in Connecticut, which will be run by myself and Wesleyan students. In the summer of 2021, we will launch our cook and wash projects, where we will be able to donate large quantities of water for people that need it to cook and bathe. Finally, our five-year plan is our lead service line replacement program, where we will be working with states to actually replace the lead service lines ourselves. I would like to take a moment to show you guys our sponsors. These businesses have invested. Not only have they invested with their funds, but they have also invested with their hearts. Every single one of my sponsors believe in me, my team, and our mission. As far as future sponsors, which I hope some of you will become, we're currently speaking with the New Jersey Devils, Coca-Cola, the American Dream, X2 Energy, and the Community Food Bank of New Jersey. Our ask, if you could find it in your heart to donate so no child has to worry about where their next glass of clean water comes from, and please consider donating. As with any newly formed nonprofit, the early stages require donations and fundraising. This is true for us as well. And I appreciate any and all support that you or your companies could provide. Sponsorship. If you own a business or work for one, that has a philanthropic arm, then please become one of our sponsors. Board of Advisors. I'm looking to grow my Board of Advisors. If you feel strongly about our mission and really want to get involved, please let me know. If you can bring great value to the table, I would love to offer a seat. And lastly, Mentors. I consider myself a student for life and would welcome the opportunity to be mentored by any one of you. If you currently have experience in nonprofits, fundraising, management, law, accounting, marketing, negotiation, or anything else you think that could help me, please reach out. Get involved. Here on this slide, you can find our GoFundMe, Zelle, and PayPal links, as well as our social media and my personal contact information. I'm looking forward to connecting with all of you, and I would like to give a huge thank you to everybody listening today. I hope you will get the chance to help me save lives one water bottle at a time, because this is who we do it for. Thank you, Vin. All right, let's see. Do we have some questions here for Vin? Any questions, comments? It's Ward Rosemary. Hi, Ward, yep, sure. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, compliment him what a great endeavor, Vin, really, so admirable. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, giving you some support. So really, job well done. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Ward. I appreciate it. We have a question here from Anne-Marie McEwen. Yeah, so um, I have four people on my board of directors as of now. And right now, my board of advisors, we have about six. Thank you. It was a, a great presentation, and I applaud your efforts. I think water is so important. So, um, so all the best with this. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. Now we're going to move on to our final presentation, um, which will be given to us by Gabriel. What's the difference between these two trucks? A lot, I know. The biggest difference is you, the taxpayer, pays for the fire truck. Unless you created the Tesla truck for 100 bucks, and I guess you would have paid for both. 
Jokes aside, the key difference, the main takeaway is that one comes with an onboard computer and the other does not. Note that the fire truck costs us up to a million dollars and doesn't come with an onboard computer. It is up to departments to buy a computer and have it installed separately. Vethos is a technology services company with years of emergency response and military experience, able to provide serious change to the current way of computing in our emergency response community. My name is Gabriel, and I'm the founder of Vethos Technologies. I have years of experience in emergency response and military technologies. Vethos has developed a more rugged and more functional and upgradable and far more affordable computing solution than what is currently offered. I've deployed and tested countless systems that are still operating without issue to this day. One of my most recent systems is a firehouse dispatching console deployed at several fire stations throughout Southern California. I want to use this experience in this sector on the problem of inadequately engineered laptops that are not affordable and for some reason being used as rig mission data terminals, industry known as MDTs. Vethos is an FCC licensed, veteran, minority owned small business ready to bring change to the NBT community. Meet the Panasonic Toughbook, an expensive, awkward, and bulky laptop designed for the masses and is being used in our million dollar fire trucks. There are a few other laptops that are being used in the industry, but these are all the same, strange, bulky laptops, with different price points. It gets worse. The other part of the problem is that these laptops require the need for so many peripheral items like you see here. You need a new mounting tray or a docking station, a new network modem for personal network access or other network access for that matter, and also network configuration of that modem. All these things just make the price go to astronomical levels. Vethos' solution to this extremely antiquated laptop model is providing a more rugged, more affordable, and easily upgradable onboard computing solution with custom engineered user interfaces specific to each organization. For intellectual property's sake, my device does not need peripherals and eliminates the need for so much real estate in a vehicle where space is finite, consolidating all these items into a sleep package that can be as discreet or as large as the user necessitates. My solution has higher temperature thresholds than the Tuckbook and has the ability to be networked into four different networks with seamless operation between all four. This network connectivity will allow the emergency response sector to have a more reliable path for their dispatch centers and will increase their system uptimes. I will work directly with clients and provide them exclusive customer service and custom engineering services. I will do this by visiting their sites and assessing all solutions necessary to fix their most complex and technology-related issues. I will charge for my consulting services and the technological solutions I provide will be competitively priced. My competitors' devices are typically antiquated within months and extremely expensive, as you see on the far right. These laptops are archaic, slow, and strangle hold the organization in the tough book ecosystem for an indefinite amount of time. The ecosystem reliance is also based on the reliance of expensive peripherals, as you see in the column second from the right. The solution for this archaic system is an extremely rugged PC that can be integrated into current networks and expandable enough to be somewhat future proof, yet secure with network encryption. Vitos can provide the device needed to solve all these problems, while also providing the commensurate services needed to an emergency response department. My initial target market is a small fire department or small agency fleet, and in the future, a large government agency or a large fleet enterprise like Amazon. Candidates that are the best fit for this solution are the agencies above in an environment where temperatures typically break the operating levels of most computing solutions. Pethos has built two prototypes and has deployed a network module on the FirstNet network and has tested the computer in a hot environment to date. Pethos has two prototypes in years of industry and military hardening experience. As you can see from the milestones below, Pethos was awarded a small grant by the Connecticut Entrepreneurship Foundation. I plan to continue these types of grant competitions to gather more funding through 2023. This winter, I plan to deploy at least two units in a small city's fleet. After device deployment, I will take orders and expand integration efforts. And in the five to seven year time frame, uh, I will plan to continue refining the product and integrate software that couples GPS mapping and OBD2 data to provide a fully integrated and modern solution 
so that the entire health of the customer's fleet can be monitored and maintained. In the 10, 10 year mark or so, I want to eventually incorporate an engineered device specifically for aviation units so that there's a seamless integration to both air and land units. This type of integration would allow an agency the ability to communicate seamlessly and avoid miscommunication. It would also allow for the deployment of software that could, could utilize machine learning to provide faster response routes and the use of actionable data through interfacing device peripherals such as LIDAR, radar, and imaging sensors. My ask are intros to anyone in any aforementioned agency, uh, any legal counsel that can help with business development, and funding for future conventions, uh, COVID willing, that is, and for more prototypes. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking with you about VFES and have a great rest of your night. Thank you, Gabriel. Does anybody have any questions for Gabriel? Hi, Gabriel, it's Mike Rohr. Congratulations. Uh, how much more money do you need, you think, to take it to the next level? Uh, it depends on the, can you guys hear me? Great. Uh, yeah. It depends on the, the fleet. Uh, I've spoken with uh, Scott Rhodes. He's the director of um, the emergency response there at Westland. Uh, so with the two prototypes that I have now, I could get into his supervisor vehicle. Um, but I have the ability to, to deploy right now uh, with two uh, units, uh, anything, you know, honestly, uh, any amount would, would help. I would, I would like, you know, to get into the 10, uh, unit, uh, range, the 10 unit range would be about, uh, 20 to $50,000, just depending on the, the operating deltas and where they're going to be deployed. Thank you. And we have another question from Sarah Bodley. Uh, Sarah asked, how large is the market? Does your price point include the customization you mentioned? Uh, the, the market is, from my estimates, uh, it, it extends from um, the Northern California area all the way to New Mexico, uh, even into El Paso, and all the way down uh, through the southern areas of Arizona. This is just like the first market that I'd like to get into. This is where their operating deltas are really high. Uh, the first 30 minutes of, of being in a vehicle, uh, you know, the computer ends up overheating, um, the, the standard computer, my computer would not. Um, and so this area, uh, that entire area has just been utilizing these laptops that are not designed for that area or for that solution. My, my device is specifically designed for that uh, specific type of uh, integration. We have one more question that I'll take from Dan Bloom, just um, due to time, um, Dan. Hey, uh, nice job. Um, question about selling to this type of a buyer, essentially, where you've got uh, a, go a government agency and, and just knowing a few other folks who have sold into these into these groups. Not sure if you have certain types of certifications or approvals or security checks that you have to go through uh, to sell into them. Have you have you come across that or thought about that? Thank you, Dan, for the question. Yes, I have thought about that and come across that. So uh, it depends on your operating license and where you're at. Uh, so the first two uh, locations that I'd like to work in are California, Texas. Uh, I'm, my business is currently certified in both of those areas. Um, and in terms of selling to the government, that's, uh, that's all of that's changing currently. There's a, a, a method called CMMC. It's a certificate maturity model certification. Uh, I've already been doing, I did an internship with a company uh, in doing that. Um, so I know the cybersecurity uh, sector. And um, so I would be able to get my company CMMC, CMMC compliant uh, within just a, a few months to be able to go after RFIs, RFQs, uh, and RFPs. And I also have a, a mentor uh, currently helping me on, on establishing all of those realms uh, just to you know, prep us for the next phases as we go into this uh, DOD uh, and contracting market. Thank you. Great questions, guys. Um, Gabriel, you do have one more question um, from Scott Moore, which you can check out as well. Um, 
All right, so now it's time to vote for tonight's winner. So I'm gonna drop a link in the chat and please click the link to select your favorite pitch. All right, here we go. We'll give everybody just a minute or two more to vote for their favorite pitch. And then um, I'm gonna let Rebecca announce the winner. We have 25 votes so far, so we have a few more moments to get more in since there's over 30 of us on the call. We vote twice. <laughs> Did you in our last election? <laughs> That's right, that's the question. <laughs> All right, who's the winner? Let's see, I'm just tabulating one more time, trying sure. to refresh it. <laughs> we have a couple that are so close. <laughs> All right, we have 31 voters so far. Get your vote in. We have a tie at the moment. Okay. I'm just gonna refresh it one more time and see if All right, so out of 31 votes total, um, we have a tie with Green Angel and Nebula Chest coming in at seven votes each. Great job, everybody. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, so um, if you'd like to connect with the students, um, you can contact them via the information they've provided on their final slide, which I'm also going to place in the chat box here. So I'm doing that right now. And Rosemary, yeah, so Mary, Rosemary, is there a way to uh, give us that information on, on your email? Yes, I can email it to everybody too. If you would do that, that would be great. Yep. Um, so a recording is going to be sent to everyone who registered for tonight's event, and I can also pass on the contact details. Um, thank you so much to all of the guest speakers and mentors who've joined us throughout the semester. Um, thank you to Michaela Kingsley, who is the director of the Patricelli Center for Social Entrepreneurship, Rebecca Mead for creating the Collision Demo Day website and for co-hosting tonight's event the Middlesex Chamber of Commerce, the Muse Plus, and Reset Social Enterprise Trust. Thank you all for attending tonight's event. I encourage you to reach out to the students if you have any questions, ideas, or advice that may help them as they move forward with their ventures. Great job to all the students and thank you all for attending. <laughs>